Doing the Dishes Refracting Personal History Through the Lens of Daily Ritual by Ann Kreilkamp, December 1989 Introduction Ever since I can remember, our family had a dishwasher. I never did understand why. To me, dishwashers were one more useless invention designed to make work for my poor mother. I can still see her standing in front of the sink, rinsing the dishes, bending over to carefully place them parallel between the rubberized metal forms, rearranging them so that they all fit, making sure the silverware goes in with the sharp points pointed upward, retrieving the bottle caps and other small things that regularly fall to the bottom, opening the cupboard door beneath the sink to reach down even further for the glossy box in the right-hand corner, opening the spout, carefully pouring the granulated soap into the two little containers on the inside of the dishwasher door. The soap always seems to spill over, and the granules stick to the fingers, closing the second container, closing the door, turning the circular crank one lurch to the right. The dishwasher starts its mechanical procedure. First, the weird chugging noise. What's going on in there? Then the water spraying inside. The dishwasher warms up the kitchen too much in summer. It's hard to talk on the phone when the dishwasher is going and it takes forever to finish. We are warned to turn it off before it starts the drying cycle as that takes so much electricity and is unnecessary. The dishes will dry anyway. Then the job of bending over to take them out of the dishwasher and put them away. Sometimes the silverware is stuck in the little rubberized holes in the bottom of their deep oblong container. Sometimes little chunks of granulated soap are stuck to some of the dishes. Sometimes a glass or a bowl is turned over full of murky water. Once in a while, the dishwasher malfunctions, spilling soapy water all over the tiled kitchen floor. Doing the dishes. One of the tasks to which, as we four older girls started getting older, we were assigned two at a time one for actually washing the dishes, another for clearing the table and wiping off the table and counters, one day or two per week. The dishwasher I remember best was built into our new custom-made suburban L-shaped house in the late 50s. We moved in the summer before my sophomore year in high school. That same model of dishwasher is still being built into new tracked homes. The one my lover owns, for example, and when I see him bending over to put the dishes in, rearranging them to fit, bending over even further to get the glossy box out of the right-hand corner under his kitchen sink, and so on, I am reminded of my mother and my childhood. I loop back from now to then and wonder, my God, has nothing changed? I didn't like dishwashers then, and I don't like them now. On the other hand, I do like doing the dishes, plunging my hands in hot soapy water, having someone hand me the dishes one by one, all the while talking, to scrub and rinse and stack in the dish rack to the side of the sink. There is a feeling of satisfaction as I watch the counters gradually clear and the dish rack gradually fill with gleaming, steamy plates and cups. I am plunged into the daily, into a human ritual I have been doing forever, and which, ever since I was seven years old, has been associated with the achievement of long-range goals. Daddy, Daddy, please, please let me have a horse. Please. Over and over again, the same refrain. I am obsessed. I cannot stop. Like approximately 50% of little girls everywhere, I live and breathe horses. Riding behind my friend Mitzi on her horse, playing horses with her in the mud, creating small paddocks and barns and forests to ride through. We fight for the privilege of being the horse, down on all fours, shown in the ring, alert, head up, 
hind legs stretched out behind. Alone, sitting on my bed, drawing pad in my lap, frustrated. I'm trying to learn how to draw my ideal horse to get the muzzle just right, showing its delicacy, refinement, to get the eyes just right. My God, they are so beautiful. Clear liquid pools warming me, melting me, seeing through to my soul. Crawling around on the floor or out in the backyard, littlest sister or brother on my back, I am every inch the horse, a proud, free, magnificent Arabian horse, tail flagging in the breeze, small, delicate, triangular head held high, ears nervously twitching, responding to the slightest perturbation in the breeze. The deep orange of carrots, the leafy forest green of hay, the brilliant spring green of grass, the gold and smoothness of oats, anything horses eat makes my mouth water. I want a horse so bad I can taste it. I begin to collect cigar boxes gathered from the house of a neighborhood friend whose father smokes cigars. There is a contest I can enter if I save a hundred boxes. Clutching the latest box, I run home and lurch to a stop in the living room, breathless. Daddy, Daddy, look at this! I cry so insistently that he actually hears me and puts his newspaper aside. Look at this! I shout excitedly, showing him the picture of the Kentucky racehorse on the side of the box, the one I'm going to win if I can just get enough boxes to enter the contest. Normally, I'm terrified of my busy doctor father with the sudden, unpredictable temper. Whenever he's home, the house feels stilted, stifled. We can't run around and shout. We aren't supposed to fight. We are supposed to be quiet so he can rest. I'm afraid of him, usually avoid him, but my passion for horses is stronger than my fear. So I keep on begging, no matter how often he refuses, I want that horse, I need that horse, I must have that horse, my very life depends on it. Finally, after I don't know how long, I must have worn him down, something of my desperate need must have penetrated even his chronic and preoccupied exhaustion. Finally, he says to me, Okay, Anne, you do the dishes for one full year, all of them, with no help from anyone else and without anyone reminding you, and you can have that horse. I am overjoyed cannot believe my good fortune. The prospects of doing the dishes for a family of 10 for a whole year do not daunt me in the least. I don't care how long it takes, don't care what I have to do to get it. All I know is the horse I have coveted ever since Mitzi got hers will soon be mine. Immediately, I sit down and make a calendar with 365 boxes in it. At the end of each day's dishes, I mark off one of the boxes. 364 days to go, 285, 123, 79. That was in May of my eighth year on earth. By June of the following year, I had earned my horse. And that is how I came to associate doing the dishes with long range plans. Nearly 39 years have passed since that fiercely determined time. 39 years of doing the dishes. Doing the dishes in sinks of many different kinds within many different types of kitchens. Indeed, to describe the long list of the various places I have done the dishes is to tell the story of my life. A peripatetic life during which I have gathered much and left much behind. I have done the dishes in big fancy kitchens equipped with butcher block island counters and Gen Air stoves. I have done them in a one room cabin where I had to haul my water in buckets. I have done the dishes with one partner after another in a commune where the schedule dictated who did the dishes with whom and when. 
I have done them in other more anarchistic communes where dishes stacked up in the sink until some sucker couldn't stand it anymore and did them. During the late 60s and early 70s, doing the dishes loomed out of the context of daily life as a highly charged symbolic focus for the changing relations between men and women. I was deeply involved with this early phase of the feminist movement, and like many other women, I carried a lot of judgments around concerning just who was supposed to be doing the dishes. In the 80s, doing the dishes had receded into the background of things again, rejoining those daily rituals that we enact over and over without thinking. Though its years in the public eye were, thankfully, brief, the emotional charge it once carried remains, though in muted form. Here and there and everywhere are women who, at certain points in their lives, make doing the dishes an embattled part of their ongoing power struggle with men. Times have changed. The question, who does the dishes, has been replaced by more urgent and drastic issues, for example, abortion, where the question becomes, who owns one's own body? Over the past several months, I've had a series of dreams which included the act of doing the dishes. Intuitively, I realize that this act in the dream, for me, is symbolic of those long-term goals with which I identified from the time I was seven years old. My task now, what I'm fiercely determined to understand, is what this goal represents specifically in my dreams now. For though I know the symbolism, I do not know the exact nature of the present goal to which the symbol refers. Childhood goals are easy, clear, definite. Some object in the outside world that will, once possessed, help one grow. The goals of a 47-year-old woman who, all her life, has been fiercely determined to attain and learn from them, will at this point be necessarily more subtle interior, difficult to discern and understand. To discover the exact nature of the current goal, I am drawn to return to my memories of doing the dishes down through the years. Perhaps this way of approaching the symbolism of the dream will present me, in the end, with clues I need to understand what is propelling me now. Chapter 1 September 1961. The beginning of my sophomore year in college, I have just transferred to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Another goal reached after one full year of begging. I wanted to go back east, away from barren western deserts, towards the tree-covered lands of intellectuals and culture. And I wanted to be nearer my high school boyfriend, Dick, now at Yale. My father has agreed to let me go back east on the condition that I transfer to another Catholic college and live with my uncle Carl, also the head of a big Catholic family of ten. I tell the crowd camps east that I want to do the dishes every night. Everybody's amazed and grateful, of course. My cousins vie for who will do them with me, since my presence adds a note of levity to this otherwise somber household. Tonight, there are three of us in the big old kitchen doing dishes. Me, Maria, my age, and also a student at Catholic U, and 12-year-old Ben. Ben has put Pete Seeger on the record player. I have never heard of folk music before. We sing along merrily as we do the dishes. Ben puts another record on. The voice is awful, nasal, grating. But the lyrics make me stop, listen more closely. I am amazed. Whatever this weird-looking young man is singing seems to be coming from deep within myself, Bob Dylan. I am being introduced to the 60s in 1961. At some point during our merry nightly chore, I break a glass, usually by dropping it on the floor. Oh, never mind, says Aunt Sadie. None of our glasses match anyway, and they are all old. After several months of 
accidentally breaking glasses during the self-appointed nightly task of doing the dishes, the contradiction between who I am pretending to be and something inside me which is not that is becoming apparent. I try to become more careful, apologize more and more profusely. Whenever I am alone with Aunt Sadie, I feel uncomfortable, feel her judgments, feel she disapproves of me, of my relationship with Dick, who sometimes visits on weekends. Chapter 2, June, 1964. I am sitting in the bedroom of our tiny apartment with son Sean, one month old. He is nursing, keeps breaking away to cry. I am seething, furious. My husband has taken over the kitchen and the living room and banished us to the bedroom. Patrick has turned the kitchen into a dark room so that he can develop photos of his models for the brochure he is preparing for graduate school applications in architecture. It is impossible to close the kitchen off from the living room, so he has darkened both rooms. In order to go to the bathroom, I must ask his permission. This goes on for weeks, doing the dishes periodically amid trays of chemicals. The dark room odor lingers, penetrates my nose, my clothes, my soul. I will never forgive him for the way he curtly appropriates whatever he wants for his own use for the way he ignores my needs, for his supreme self-centeredness. My friends don't like him, think he brags too much. They wish I had married Dick. I am afraid of my husband the way I was afraid of my father. Only between now and then something has changed. If the horse was my ticket to emotional freedom, Now I seem to have forgotten that I have any rights whatsoever. I am 21 years old. Chapter 3, September 1965. I am standing at the stainless steel sink of the kitchen at Peabody Terrace, brand new Harvard graduate student housing. Turning around, I am once again astonished at our great good fortune. The view from the kitchen's picture window shows the entire Boston skyline with the Charles River winding below. We are at the very top of this award-winning high-rise building on the 20th floor in a brand new apartment with two bedrooms, one for us, one for Sean and the new baby, due in three months. Sitting on top of the world, our future rolling out in front of us, Harvard, success, reputation, fame. I am alone most of the time here. I don't mind. I am grateful. And when Patrick does come home, I have to keep Sean quiet so he can work at the enormous drafting table he has set up in the living room. I spend my time fixing meals, doing dishes and other housework, collecting recipes, reading women's magazines, pushing the stroller through Harvard Square, jealous of the students of privilege passing casually by in their Levi's and green book bags, trying to not let my distaste for my new husband show, furious at him for my again pregnant condition. At night, I dream of Dick. Chapter 4. November 1967. Evening. The children finally asleep, sitting at the kitchen table trying to study. I am in my second year of graduate school, Boston University, aiming for a doctorate in philosophy. I am feeling content. The dishes are done. The washing machine, also in the kitchen, is on, filled with Collins diapers. The children's long, low table, covered in washable yellow plastic, littered with blocks and Lego toys, two small wicker chairs tucked underneath, fills the wall under the big windows. Sean's wonderful watercolors are plastered all over the refrigerator and walls, a cheerful room. I like this kitchen, this apartment, five rooms. Patrick even has his own study, but he doesn't spend much time there sits in the living room on the chaise lounge watching TV. 
I have cleverly set up the fan so that its white noise covers the canned laughter, the urgent voices of newscasters listing body counts from Vietnam. I am content. My life is in control. Have made my peace with the marriage. Have found myself within it so that it no longer takes all my time and attention. Working for my doctorate helps me gain and keep this personal space open. It feels a lot like the time I sat down to make the calendar to get the horse. My life seemed impossible until that moment, seemed like a prison from which there was no escape. Once I set my goal, I am no longer swamped by circumstances. No matter what he does or says, no matter how critical he becomes of the way I fix my hair, of my clothes, of my talent as a cook, I inhabit this space within which I am impervious to him. This is the first long-range goal, my first really challenging goal since the horse. And I am pulling it off. There's a big Irish family next door that supplies me with babysitters. I get out of the house every afternoon for classes. But how to explain the odd experience the other night when I was standing at the big, deep, old porcelain sink doing the dishes as usual, and all of a sudden I grabbed on, had to grab on for dear life in order to keep from falling. All of a sudden my awareness swooshed out, jetted out with great force and seeming direction into space, to somewhere else, some other space or dimension strange and indescribable, totally alien to my life here in this apartment, this city of Cambridge, with these children, this husband. How do I make sense of that weird experience? How do I prevent it from happening again? How do I explore it further? Chapter 5, January 1968. We are in Boston at a dinner party with other architects and their wives. I have slipped into the kitchen to do the dishes. Love the feel of hot water on my cold hands. Love the sensual feeling of the water, how its heat brings me back down into my body. Glad my hostess has left her apron out so that I can cover my good dress. It's harder to do the dishes when I have to think about standing back far enough so that my clothes don't get wet. The vehement cacophony of male voices in the next room hurts my ears, even from this distance. Arguing about theater, opera, architecture, politics, talking about student deferments, cities being burned. I doubt anybody has noticed my absence. The men certainly don't. They are too wrapped up in their conversation. The women probably don't either, as each of them seems to be off in her own world, pretending to listen to the men, but really just waiting for them to finish so her husband will take her home. Love being right here, in front of this sink. My feet planted wide on the floor, my hands warmed in the water. I am drawn to the hot, wet heat. It makes me feel safe somehow, secure, feel more real here in the kitchen than in there. Don't have to keep my mask on when I'm doing dishes. Don't have to smile, observe the forms, think, reply. Can just do the dishes, one after another. Some require scrubbing, some don't. Another woman wanders in, offers to take over. I decline. Offered to dry the dishes then. Okay, half grudgingly, half gratefully, I admit her into my solitude. We begin to talk. We can talk differently in here than out there. Our voices are low, murmuring, personal. We talk about our children, our husband's work, our plans. I don't talk about what I am studying. No one would understand it. There is no one except my teacher to whom I can even approach the subjects which fascinate me. The exact nature of the relation between thought and language. The development of Sean's visual perception as viewed through his drawings, which I have carefully kept and dated. How the body and the mind are related to one another. Whether or not the mind is confined to the brain. These questions preoccupy me. 
I am filled with them and others like them, have a hard time being a mother, being truly present for my children. Can I talk about this to the woman now handing me dirty dishes? No. She seems happy. Seems like her children are her life. I envy her. I think her beneath me. Chapter 6 September 1969 Dinner time. Sitting at our kitchen table in a real dining room in our new apartment in Brookline. The kitchen too small to eat in. Don't like the kitchen. Don't like the standard metal cupboards, the anonymous feel to it. Don't like doing the dishes here. Don't like doing all the housework. My God, shouldn't he do some of this daily stuff too? I work as hard as he does, having to study continuously, take exams, write papers, only to come home and be confronted with the whole overwhelming mess that two young children continually make, their constant needs, their fights, their unhappiness. I want him to start sharing the housework, but every time I bring the subject up, he says, okay, I'll do the housework and you go out and find a job. This shuts me up. I am terrified of the world outside. Cannot conceive of myself in a regular job. Try to keep my complaints to myself. I hate him. Can't stand the sight of him.